All right. Hello. Welcome back to another fun-filled episode of the Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin, and joining me today is Sven Rieger, who is a, a strong first elite. He's a strong first team leader, and uh, despite his name, he's actually not Norwegian. He is German. We were having a nice long conversation about various different uh, popular German things, such as the automobiles, the accents, the different countries where people speak German. I wowed him with like the three sentences I know in German. So we've already gotten a good chance to get acquainted with, uh, you know, some fun stuff like that. But we have saved the best part for you, dear listener. And we're going to be talking about strength and how to obtain it, as well as a bit of the background that Sven has and how he helps people to crush weakness all the live long day in his uh, humble town and a humble little country called Germany. And uh, as well as some of the really, really impressive feats that he himself has managed and how he's helped other people by taking that knowledge that he's used in the process of getting freakishly strong and helped other people bring themselves up as well. So we're going to get started momentarily. Before we do, I, of course, want to remind anybody, if this is the first time you were listening to the show or the 50th, I have no idea, and you have not already gotten my nine minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge. Uh, you're doing yourself a big disservice, and uh, I'm going to encourage you to uh, to change that right now. Uh, but I think you'll like it because it is designed around the gait pattern or your walking pattern. So stuff like crawling, loaded carries, and other things that take like 30 seconds to learn how to do but have a huge impact on your overall strength. I've had a lot of people who do the nine-minute challenge who either add it as a bookend to their regular program, so they do it like either as a warm-up or as a finisher, and uh, they'll tell me, oh my gosh, my press has got stronger, my squats are better, I feel more tied together. I get a lot of that, T better tied together, and everybody wants to be stronger and more resilient, and uh, this is a good start. So uh, if you want your own free copy, just go to 9minutechallenge.com, and uh, it is yours. And that is the number 9minutechallenge.com. Although I have to admit, if you were to type in N-I-N-E minutechallenge.com, you would also get there. I had a, I was on a podcast maybe a couple months ago and um the it was a guest and the guy told me like hey what what website do you want me to you know put put up like for your information and i said nine minute challenge.com but i said it was with the number nine and he put up n-i-n-e minute challenge.com so i had to go buy that and then redirect it to nine minute challenge.com so uh there, all roads lead to rome folks i just want you to know that but in any case i've rambled long enough sven welcome to the show Thank you so much for having me on, Alex. Um, quite the introduction. I will try to live up to the standard you set. <laughs> well, I think you already have because, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you've achieved some pretty impressive <laughs> uh, pretty impressive feats in the world of strength and, and are, they're rare ones too. So we'll talk a little bit about that on the kettlebell side of things as well as on stone lifting, which used to be super popular. I guess it's really only popular now like yeah, or it's retained its popularity, let's say, in Scotland yeah. and then uh, in the Basque country of Spain, where they still love to lift stones all the live long day. And uh, maybe that'll be your next challenge, do like a stone lifting competition in, in the Basque country. Well, not a competition, but there is something on the horizon, let's say. Oh. Uh, one thing a little closer, the other thing will probably take longer than I would like it to. But uh, yeah, you, you're a... aiming in the right direction. Good, good. Well, you know what? I'll have to send you when this is over. I'll have to send you an article <laughs> from um, one of my favorite strength blogs of all time. It's called Plague of Strength by... Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah, Jamie Lewis. He's been on my podcast yeah. a few times. He's uh, like a genius at all things history of strength. And he's crazy strong too. I mean, like, so he's not just like a strength historian. He, he really lives it. Uh, but he had a really interesting article, uh, a couple of them. It was like kind of a short series on strength training as it existed in millennia past. And, you know, one of the things he talked about is that stone lifting was very, very common around the world. I mean, from yeah. anywhere from China yeah. to, again, you know, even now in, in Basque country and Spain and, and all over the place. And it's kind of fallen out of favor, but it used to be really common. You would have like big stone. Everybody would have to try to lift it. It was kind of like, a, you know, a communal thing. And uh, I still think it's one of the best and most like one of the purest forms of strength training in a certain yeah, sense. It, it's, it is. Yeah, it's as real world as it gets. And you've, you know, let's just jump into this because since we're talking about it, <laughs> um, you lifted 
Well, tell us what there were some stones that have a reputation for being very difficult to lift, and uh, nevertheless, you lifted them. And uh, tell us a bit about that. <laughs> that is a interesting story, and t- to this day, I still cannot really tell you what drew me into that. Um, a few years ago, Rogue put out the, the stone lifting documentaries. So mm. the first one, I think, was the Levantadores about the ones in the Basque country. Right. Which was super fantastic because I never heard of that uh, tradition in, in such a scale, let's say. Yeah. And um, the following one was Stoneland, which was about Scotland and all the historic lifting stones out there. And uh, the final one, which was actually their, their, the longest one, which is, I think, 90 minutes, something like that, uh, was about Iceland and the whole culture and the land itself and how it basically forced people to get strong and, and how these tests um, fit into the whole, yeah, into the whole culture kind characteristic of. culture of, of the people who live there because if you look at uh crossfit if you look at strongman a lot of the very strong and and dominating figures are actually coming from iceland oh and yeah given its size that it's just such, such a small country but has a reputation for producing let's say uh, such a crazy amount of, of strong people it, it was just fascinating to to see a little more behind the the heritage let's say that was the word I yeah. was looking for because it got basically passed down from generation to the next, um, all the way going back to the Viking ages where people um, were needed to do heavy labor on, on the boat, on land as well. And the, the stones of strength basically were their way of measuring the usefulness um, of, of the individual. Yeah. So th- there's a... There are four stones uh, on a on a beach. I don't recall the, the name of the location, but you basically have the smallest one, which would translate to to useless. <laughs> um, so you were not of any use if you just could li- lift that one. And then the the uh, heaviest one would be full stercur, so the, the full strength, and only that would give you the full pay on on a uh, working on a ship. So. Wow. Um, it, it's it has a very deep roots in there, and as you said, you can trace that back in different countries over the whole world. I mean, um, I just saw a interesting document a documentary about the whole thing in Japan, mm. and I never heard of stone lifting in Japan before. So um, it, it's it's a fascinating thing, and for whatever reason, um, Scotland really spoke to me. Um, especially the Dini stones, um, which date back at least to 1886, I think. Yeah. Uh, Donald Dini lifted them um, basically as part of his work to construct bridges or do reconstruction work on them. So they were basically the counterweight to the um, um, apparatus he used to do the, the the work there yeah and so he was carrying them so he was not just lifting them basically he was carrying them across the bridge and also the length of the bridge um so not, not in a farmer walk like we think about when we're carrying stone but still um that is such an impressive feat especially if you know the dimension of the bridge so just having that in my head i was like how can somebody have done that over 200 years ago almost no not quite but over 100 years definitely and um w- without the, the the strength training systems we have available by now yeah and uh j- just the history and the um the myths around the stones that was what what drew me in and then i saw jason marshall uh one of our strong first master instructors lift the stones in 2019 and that's when I was like, okay, you know what? I I think I'm going to to actually do that as well because it's always you have those things in your head, but you don't know really how to to get started. And then you see somebody else doing it. And this is your your impulse. This is like, okay, let's let's give that a try. Yeah. It's like Donnie Thompson, who's a uh elite level power lifter, he would say, Why not me? 
you know, he would say other people oh, do yeah. an incredible feats of strength and he'd say, why not me? You know, mm -hmm. and I think that's very much the the response that a lot of people have. And I think in particular, when you see somebody who is a part of your community doing it, you're like, oh, well, this it just makes perfect sense to do this because this it fits in with what we do and strong first, mm -hmm. you know, we lift heavy things. And Jason Marshall is a perfect example because that dude's like he's built like a rock. I mean, I met him one time. I shook his hand. He like it might as well have been a brick. <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, like you try to, you know, give like a nice firm handshake. And it was, yeah, it was like legitimately like shaking hands with a brick. I mean, he's he's a solid, solid dude. I'm not sure if you can see it on, on the screen, but but right behind me, there is a, the picture oh, yeah. of. Oh, and that's my girlfriend. Oh, hi there. <laughs> Getting everything to change diapers. <laughs> so th that's the picture of Jason lifting the stones right next to mine um decorating awesome. my courage corner I like and it. i mean without him just seeing him doing it but then also um having him as a as a mentor and giving me so many valuable tips um he was actually well he was not there on site but um i had him on a video call during my attempt so claire booth from from england and um tony mac Gormel, I think I'm butchering the name, but two strong first instructors. And I mean, Claire is also a strong first senior instructor mm -hmm. and the country leader in Great Britain. So they drove up to Scotland to be there and uh, cheer me on. Wow. Um, so so they had the phone. Jason <laughs> watched my attempts. I failed the first one, actually. Uh, and then he he gave me some 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 pep talk in between the first and second attempt. So without him, um, that would not have happened at all. So now People might be wondering how heavy are the Dinny stones? So the Dinny stones together weigh three hundred and thirty-two point, I think, eight four kilograms. Um, the it's interest... about seven hundred thirty-three pounds for the Americans listening. Yeah, exactly seven thirty-three, seven thirty-five. I'm not sure. According to the, uh, I just looked it up. Oh so, yeah, <laughs> yes, it's seven hundred thirty-three. I wouldn't have been able to do the calculation in my head. I'm trust blindly trusting the internet, so hopefully they have not steered me wrong. But I know it's upwards of seven hundred. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, it's so it's two stones, and they are different sized and different in weight. Yeah. So there's a bigger one around one eighty-eight, and the smaller one is around one forty-four. So um, that is actually one of the big challenges um, that the stones um, uh, possess because you will have to lift not only from a very, let's say, compromised position, mm -hmm. having to hold on to two different weights, but they're also different in height and different in, uh, different in weight. Yeah. So that makes the whole thing a different, a completely different challenge than you would expect mm -hmm. um, just from, let's say, lifting barbells. Yeah. Um, by, by now, you can get loadable pins with imitation handles um, to, to spe uh, specifically train for that. But if I recall correctly, Jason actually had those handmade because they were not available during the time he was training for that. Right. So, um, and even prior, let's say, so the first man to lift the st Dinny stones after um, Donald Dinny himself actually was uh, Jack Shanks from, from Ireland. Mm. And he got measurements of the stones and he um, actually made them out of cement. Wow. To, to get a feel for the different uh, weights and, and, and uh, heights to pull from. So it's, it's super fascinating to see just in that short span of time, how people develop different methods to train for that. It's, it's super fascinating. You know, what else is very interesting too, for the intrepid listener who may have caught this, you mentioned, you know, marveling at how people could get strong, uh, could get so strong before we had the systems in place that we have now. And the interesting thing is that if you look closely, you'll see that, for instance, what we do with strong first and what other strength training systems do is they try to, systematize and organize just the natural uh, rhythm that goes along with strength training and physical development in general. And so you think like, you know, uh, Dinny having to move these stones, you know, for, you know, the construction work being done on bridges and, and things like that, you know, he probably wasn't doing them like as many reps as possible, 
You know, he yeah. wasn't forcing himself to do it. It was like there was enough rest in between. So that was, you know, the the concept of rest in between your sets and that power loves rest is something that you could see. And it was just a part of his work. And so what we do is, in a large sense, uh, a throwback to the way that people got strong naturally, even using oddball implements. You know, and again, I when I think of oddball implements, in some sense, the kettlebell is kind of like a... Um, a way of systematizing that because it's this awkward piece of weight that's you know offset center of gravity this sort of a thick handle and uh, it, it does have some good calibration to it so it's not completely awkward like a stone which doesn't have any particular you know uh calibration like or particularly like a barbell like we would see but it's interesting to see that because these are all things that you can train for up to a certain point with a barbell with dumbbells with kettlebells but then that that element of specificity also comes into play where you mentioned uh, this uh, Shanks fellow from Ireland had to make sure that he had the specific measurements, the heights from which to pull. And Denny got good at it just by doing it, you yeah. know, just as a, as a matter of course, it was just the task at hand. But for, if anybody else wants to get good at that task at hand, particularly if it's something that's very, very challenging, eventually specificity has to come into play. So there is this general uh, sense of, or there is this general, uh, we'll say forward movement of getting stronger, but then as you get more focused in what it is that you're trying to accomplish, you've got to be much more specific. And it sounds like that was what you did and what Jason did and certainly what uh, what Shanks did. I cannot speak for the, the other two, but I can speak for myself. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is that I only recognized that process when I was sitting down afterwards and I analyzing the whole thing. Yeah. I was like, you know what? There's actually a pattern there. I went from from the general to the more specific to the very specific mm -hmm. without actually uh, realizing that yeah. in, in the first place. That was that was super interesting to see. Um, a, a lot of these things, sometimes you just do naturally. And I think that it, this is what, like you said, the, the old timers, let's say, in a way also did. They, they did not know exactly why the things they do work. They just could tell, okay, I'm getting stronger. So whatever I'm doing here is working. Yeah, and um, you 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 figure out the why very often just in the process of doing it. Yeah, that's one of the things that I one of the reasons why I think I appeal more to what old timers did as opposed to you know what a, a current trend is in the fitness industry, which is the science based training, in air quotes yeah. science based because you know I don't think it's wrong, I don't think it's bad by any means, but I think a lot of times um, people are uh, sort of overlooking the stuff that we've already basically established. And there's always the other thing too, with a lot of the studies that you, that you see, it's easy for people to latch on to one and say, well, this is the way that things are supposed to be done. Or the science says that this is what works. But if we can look back and we can see, well, you know what, uh, these people were able to achieve incredible levels of strength in way worse conditions, then there's still some value in that. And I think possibly even more because if something works, uh, even when conditions are bad, it's probably going to be a pretty safe system to use. Uh, I do think that the value of of the scientific method and strength training is that we can get a better understanding of why things work, yeah. or maybe uh, you know shave down the excessive effort that sometimes people will put into things. Like I just yesterday I was talking to Jeff Newport, and we were talking about how um, you know when you get started and you read the education of a bodybuilder by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you look at the, the amount of work that he did. If you think, well, that's the only way to do it. And you know, and you try it and you're like, this doesn't work for me because the volume is way too high and I'm working out for two hours. Well, then it's helpful to realize that there are other, you know, other ways to do things. So um, in that sense, yeah, I think it's, I think it's valuable, but it, particularly if you look back and you see what principles, the training of the old timers, anything, anywhere from Donald Denny to, uh, Arthur Saxon, Eugene Sandow, a couple of nice German fellows, right? Uh, that they were able to achieve without, you know, appealing to people with white coats and, you know, double blind studies and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing to see that they all came to the same conclusions and that there's really no need to rewrite the whole book on strength training. It's, it's right no. there in front of us. I think the only thing that needs to be rewritten probably is how they express those things. Yeah. Because our use of language 
is, is different by now. Our words are different than we use. So sometimes you go back to these old texts and you're like, what the hell are they talking about? Very general. So yeah. like when, yeah, when they, when they're describing a certain lift or, or describing the position of the body or the, the movement of the weight or a joint, um, it's, comp it's different than we would express it nowadays. Um, so, so that might be a nice project for somebody out there. Um, let's say translating those things. Um, I know that Pavel Matzek really takes a deep dive into those uh, old texts yeah. and um, uses them as a source of inspiration for what he does. Um, not creating, not reinventing the wheel, let's say, but just um, making the things a little bit more straightforward. Certainly. Like you say, shaving off the extra effort. Yeah. Um, and that is, I think... There is, I think it comes from the uh, um, New Zealand, from the Ma Maori, mm -hmm. where, where like they have the, the, the so they symbolize the different, um, oh man, I'm missing the word. Say in German. For our German. The, the generations. Oh, there we go. The different generations, isn't it? By laying one rock on top of the other. Yeah. And that's how you build something, right? Certainly. So, in a sense, I think that's exactly what what, what Pavel does. Yeah. So Pavel Tsatsulin and Pavel Matzik as well in that in that case. Yeah. So they 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 take a look at what was successful for the old timers, and then they try to to improve a little bit on that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think because we live in a different time, it's a necessity to do that because we also don't have the same living conditions. Exactly. We're not as physically yeah. active. So there are some gaps that need to be filled along the way to get them to being able to practice certain things in a in a certain way. And then you see people like Brooks Kubik or like you said, like Jeff Newport, yeah. who over the last 10, 20 years put out amazing material on what actually what what kind of value shorter training sessions can can provide yeah you, you don't have to go to the gym and train for 2 hours flat and and kill yourself i mean brooks is a is a with his abbreviated training sometimes has sessions like like 20 30 minutes and even jeff look at his his programs he's putting out yeah. lately it's all 20 to 30 minutes and then you're thinking like no that can't be enough because you compare it to all those routines of of some bodybuilders or or power lifters and and in that case yes if that's your your uh, your scale then it looks like you do not enough but if you have the whole picture the the bigger picture approach then you you realize very well that those are just like let's say uh the it's just a single training session yeah. it's not the whole training process right it's Dan John used to use that example for for a while also like um when he when he talked about what you need to do to be successful for to throw the discus he was like yeah you you train three times a week in the weight room and you go and throw the disc discus four times a week for the next eight years yeah he always was joking like people miss the eight years part yeah so it's not the single training session no, it's it's the continuity. Yeah, the other thing, too, is that nowadays so many people are much more likely to be sedentary, um, e even in the sense that not just that they have jobs where they're seated, but that their physical activities and their hobbies are also not very physically active. And so they think, well, look, all these other people did all this work and it, it worked for them. It's like if you're going from zero and you think you're going to go from zero to 60, meaning 60 minutes and you're going to do that. Some people can do it for sure because some people make a decision and then they're, you know, there's no mental block in the way. They've just made a decision and they do it. But most people need to go from zero to a much smaller number, like 10 minutes or nine yeah. minutes. Wink, yeah. wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. My nine minute challenge. .com. There's a certain challenge out there. Yes. I've heard of. So, so I've heard. It was written by a very handsome <laughs> Jewish man. Oh, very handsome. Yeah. Yes. I've yeah. seen pictures. So have I. So have I. I see him every time I look in the mirror. In fact. <laughs> um, but the, if you're not able to do, 10 minutes or nine minutes, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to do 60 minutes. So it makes more sense to go and do these shorter ones. And then the other thing too, is again, you know, going back to Jeff, I picked this up from him many years ago is that it's not how much work you can do. It's how much work you can recover from. Yes. If you can't recover, it's like, well, it doesn't matter how hard you work because you know, like frequency matters, but 
you're not going to be able to train frequently if you're constantly limping through your days until you get to your next session, at which point you just smash yourself with another like excessively difficult exercise routine. It's like you need to have some you need to have a plan. And if you're planning on getting much older anyway, start off a little bit more slowly and pick up speed as time goes on. Exactly. Now, you've also uh, hit a pretty impressive milestone in the kettlebell world as well. And um, <laughs> I, I want to transition to that in particular because it's one that people have heard whispers of and very few people have actually accomplished. And it's a big enough accomplishment where you like you get noted for having done it. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that, because I know you know what I'm referring to, but I don't yes, want to steal I, I do know what you're telling about. Yeah. So uh, let's start the story in, I think it was 2013 or I think 13, when Pavel released Kettlebell Simple and Sinister. Mm -hmm. And then you were like, okay, swings and get-ups, you've done that before. Yeah. Um, and then he puts out the challenge at the very end of the book. Like, okay, this is, would be the simple goal, but here is Sinister. Yeah. I mean, the name Sinister just has a ring to it. And um, for those of you who do not know the, the challenge, it's basically 100 swings in five minutes. But it's not any set or rep count you to your liking. So you have to do 10 swings every 30 seconds, switch hands from set to set. After your last set of swing, you rest for a minute. And then you do 10 get-ups, one every full minute for the next 10 minutes. So it's 100 swings and 10 get-ups total. The simple goal would be the 32 kilogram bell for men. Sinister would be the 48 kg bell for men. And back at that time, I mean, my, my training weight was probably the 24. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, simple, that might be achievable. But, but sinister, I was like, for, forget about that. Yeah. And... um. As the years went by and I got stronger because I did a few things right. Luckily, I did a lot of stupid things as well. I uh, cannot claim just um, the good things. Yeah. But, but I was getting closer and closer to comfortably actually swing the 40. And then I made first attempts at the 48. Nice. Um, and then after my SFG level two, in 2018, I participated at the TSC in in October of the same year. Um, fairly successful in what used to be the elite division. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, you know what? I need a new goal. Sitting at home, I saw Simple and Sinister, the book, on the shelf. And I was like, you know what? I think I might actually give this a try. Uh, it took me way longer than... I would have liked it to. Um, again, doing multiple stupid things, but very lucky to have the guidance of Pavel Matzek at that time. Uh, and to my knowledge, I was the first one to reach Sinister here in Germany. Mm. Um, at least officially. There might have been others who did it, um, but they never got it accredited. Oh, so, right. um, yeah, and that was in 2020. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you, you do not know this, but this is a very interesting part of the story for me, at least. Um, I was listening to an interview with you, and I think it was on Sean Sewell's podcast, oh, that, um, yeah, that German, where you were talking about the, the, the power of visualization and, yeah. and setting goals and stuff like that. And for whatever reason what popped in my head was at that time, because I was training for Sinister during that time. It's like, you know, it would be really cool, not just to do Sinister, but to do it in such a way um, that it would be really impressive. And, and maybe even Brett noticed it. And uh, lo and behold, I submitted my Sinister video, which was actually the third attempt, mm -hmm. I think, if I remember correctly. So I had to do it back to back um, two weeks in a row. <laughs> oh, God. Because on this, so the first time was a complete disaster, and I clearly wasn't ready at that point. But the second time, um, I miscounted in two sets. So I had actually a hundred swings, but I did one set with eleven. And at that point, it was like, yeah, maybe the video will pass. And then the next one was just nine swings, and I was like, yeah, screw it. Um, I'm not going to send it because I lost count during yeah. during the attempt, and I was like, no, I'm going to finish it. I, it might have been. 
uh, just 10 reps, not just 11, but no, nah, it wasn't. So, but uh, what I'm trying to get is I actually got an email from Brad afterwards and he was like, congratulations to Sinister. Um, one of the strongest attempts he has seen so far. I was like, seriously, that is, uh, well, a little, uh, uh, quite a special moment for me. Very and much I still so. have the screenshot and I have the email still. That's amazing. In, in you gotta, you gotta frame folder. it. You gotta put it up right next to you and uh, Jason Marshall in the background. There. That is actually what I had in mind. <laughs> See, look at that. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're like channeling each other. Yeah, it is. A, it's a tough challenge. You know, I've done. Yeah. I did simple and sinister. I think everybody was kind of doing it back in like 2013, 2014. and I, I didn't. I never got to the sinister stage uh, in part because I didn't have a 48 kilo bell, and also it just wasn't a part of my my uh my interest at the time but uh, i did get through uh simple and it was that's tough enough i mean just mm -hmm. getting to 32 kilos that will that will get your attention to do that and with I, uh, the and i like games. what what sorry <laughs> i like what pablo writes in the book about this he says simple is achievable for anyone yeah and he says once you um achieved simple your fitness is probably better than that of 90 80% uh, of the people running into gyms around the world definitely um sinister he says that's a different kind of thing because he didn't base the weight on age or body weight he says it's the same for anyone he doesn't yeah. care in the street fight nobody cares as well and yeah. i i to some degree i like that argument um because some jealous just just do not care about your 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 circumstances in 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 a certain way mm -hmm. so um but but he said clearly that that's not for everybody yeah so um if you listen to this and you haven't done simple my advice is to train for simple and do it um sinister that's yeah different story yeah i think that's a good example too of like a lot of times people who are not uh not consistent with their training decide they want to do something crazy you know like it's like oh i want to run a marathon it's like well you know you gas out walking up the stairs so why don't you try a 5k first you know don't go crazy and uh i think it's the same thing with simple and sinister you know like if you can aim for simple first and you keep that as your single-minded focus mm -hmm. then later on down the line you can think about sinister but a lot of times people are looking too far into the future and they end up psyching themselves out and a part of we talked about the visualization because i remember that chat with with sean uh, a big part of that is you have to see yourself successful and, yeah, you know, exactly. it, it, it's got to be, um, it doesn't have to be reasonable even. It doesn't have to be rational, but it does have to be something where, um, you know, if you have a big, irrational, crazy goal, at a minimum, you should be able to see yourself succeeding at something yeah. uh, smaller that doesn't induce any anxiety and then you take the steps to actually achieve it. And then you compare your memories of those visualizations. And then you compare it to what you've just accomplished. And now all of a sudden, a lot of these other roadblocks and speed bumps start to get a lot smaller because you think, okay, there are going to be challenges along the way, but I, I don't have as many questions about my ability to achieve these things anymore because I've already shown myself that I can do this. So if I can do this, certainly I can do the next step because I've already I've already moved in that direction. It's a much smaller distance than it was before. That's pretty much what you said in the in the interview. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly true. And then how do you apply that too? Because, you know, you've had to do this for yourself. And I think given that you work with people full time, this is your job as a as a as a trainer. So are you able to do the same thing and get people to to kind of organize their efforts in the same way when you're training them with, with their own strength? Is that like a big part of what you do? Yeah, basically. Um, organizing people is actually a nice way to put it because I think one issue sometimes is people don't realize how strong they are. Yeah. And so just giving them a clue of what they're actually capable of at that time right now, independent of their goals, um, sometimes, like you said, that removes a lot of the roadblocks they see upcoming yeah. because all of a sudden they realize, you know what, I can actually do more, uh, than I, than I thought I would be capable of. I, a few months ago, I had a guy, uh, coming for a, for a training session. Um, I think he was training with the, the 16 kilo kettlebell for, for swings. And I, um, 
demonstrated to him that he's fairly able to swing the 32, which is a hundred percent increase. Yeah. So that, just seeing his eyes going like, I just did that. That was, that was cool. That was super cool. Yeah. Um, and, and, I mean, it's like, like you said, it's the same thing for me. Sometimes you, you, you see those roadblocks and you think I will never be able to, to do such a, a big thing, but um, just imagining yourself actually doing that and then starting a process training towards that, I think for most people is, is, is the big key. Yeah. Once you started, you gain momentum. Yeah. And you will get stronger along the way. And something that you would describe as a small step will actually be, well, seen from the outside, way, way bigger than you think it is. So, for example, on, on well, Thursday last week, um, my planned training session fell short because of Liam, our son, decided mm-hmm. to, to get up at uh, 5... 45 in the morning it was very nice of him usually the t- the time i train yeah so air quotes all i did was 30 minutes of snatches with the 40 kg bell wow. which was like i actually planned on doing a few pre- clean and presses and a few yeah. pistol squats but i just again the air quotes got in my snatches and it was like uh, it's better than nothing sure but then just taking a step back and, and thinking about what i just just said is like you know you're actually so crazy talking about uh doing 150 reps in total i think with the 40 bell kg bell um to to anybody else that would be just crazy and um yeah it's interesting where those little steps can take you yeah one of the things that i really try to get my students and followers to focus on is process-based goals versus outcome-based goals. You know, because the thing is, it's like, and by the way, this is true for pretty much everything. Like, you know, for instance, for for business, I have business-related goals and they might be sales goals, but to a a pretty great extent, I I don't have control over how much I can, you know, how much I can make in sales or how many, how I can, uh, how much money exactly. But what I have control of is, the the daily action steps that I take. And the same thing is true for when I learn foreign languages, for when I train. And that's the big thing that I try to get people to understand is this is a process that works for literally anything that you want to get better at. And I think people have a hard time, a harder time applying it to strength training more than anything because it's it's like the big unknown we'll say fitness in general because in some sense it's like the big unknown there's so much contradictory information out there there's so many competing ideas and belief systems i'm sure you get asked stuff like this all the time like oh what do you think about you know this new thing or whatever in the fitness world like like i remember when i was just getting started it was muscle confusion i don't know if you ever heard about that of course yes i do which is (laughs) I, you know, like I, I understand it from a marketing perspective. You got to make it something that's appealing to people. And as long as it gets people to move, okay, it's not that big of a deal. But your muscle's not confused. It only contracts. <laughs> that's it. So it it knows what it's supposed to do. There's no, you know, there's no confusion involved. But um, but getting people to understand, you know what, if you, what do you, th- like, just think about it logically. If you showed up every day and you did, let's say, 50 swings, any weight you want, you know, any denomination it could be five at a time 10 at a time 20 it doesn't matter if you were to do that every day uh with no focus on anything on any particular goal with your swings and you did that every day for three months what do you think would happen it's like oh. you'd get way stronger so like but why don't you do it well i don't know you know i think yeah. a big this is my perspective is that i think a lot of people view their training as needing to be some type of like adventure or entertainment. And there's an element of that. But more than anything, yeah. people need to also treat it like something like 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 work in a sense where they punch the clock, show up, do it. The process itself should be enjoyable, but that's over the long haul. It doesn't have to be that each and every workout is yes. like a mile a minute thrill ride. And that's what people miss. Exactly. But but like you said, it's it's all the contradict- uh, contradictory information out there. Yeah, you hear so many different things, and and we all tend to gravitate towards those things we like to hear. Yeah, 
not necessarily the things we know to be true. And you're like, you know what? I'm just going to give that a try. And then you try, I don't know, three, four, five different programs or methods. Let's say you're spinning your wheels. Um, the cool thing, though, is it's not, let's say, waste of time. You still did something. Yeah. I just hope, and um, this is also one of my goals, like giving people the idea that at one point, everything will sum up you did until that point. Mm -hmm. And you you educate with the things you try. Yeah. You, I think you realize when when things go wrong or when they go well um but but what people and this is also something i took from dan john once you did a training program once you finished something re-evaluate what you did and yeah. how it worked because only then will you be able to take the conclusions from that and there is to learn something from everything you do yeah it's like 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 the cliche like failure is just an opportunity to, to learn but it is exactly that if you take it as such certainly that doesn't mean that we're trying to fail on purpose, but but not everything you do will be successful. I can't exactly. tell you how many training programs I tried and did not work for whatever reason. So um, there, there was a press program I tried that worked wonderfully for Jason and one of his students. So uh, he's training an, uh, a super strong lady. She's a powerlifter, I think national level. Um, she pressed the 44 kg bell. Like that's just mind boggling. Damn. And Jason used the same plan to to press the the double 48, which is also something completely crazy. Freakish. I gave the same program a try and it just did not work. Yeah. For for whatever reason. I'm not sure. Life stress maybe at that point, because I was in a transition phase. Uh, sleep was not really good. <laughs> a lot of stuff going on. It might just not have been the program for me. Or I might just have done too many other things around that. Because I'm also just a, uh, a metal uh, metalhead, uh, knucklehead, as they yeah. like to say. Yeah. So I'm not sure. But you have to, to take those things into account. And if you are willing to extract the lessons out of them then it will at one point lead you closer to to a, a process that will actually work for you certainly and i think the I, i've certainly had that experience too for instance i've tried multiple times to do the fighters pull-up program and it's never done anything for me um i'm not an idiot i know a thing or two about doing pull-ups i'm kind of good at them it's just mm -hmm. it doesn't work for me it, mm -hmm. it's worked yeah. for a lot of other people i know yeah. uh, you know mike perry's a senior SFG, yeah. his wife did it and went from six to 12 pull-ups. So it like, yeah. it works for a lot of people, you know, but uh, every time I've done it, it just hasn't, hasn't been what I needed. And I, you know, I have some ideas as to why, but I think it does come down to what you as an individual need for me, for instance, I think, um, the, the frequency of it, like doing it daily was definitely not wise for me. Um, I think also the, uh, I have a tendency to be just looser, you know, and so I need more tension in order to get stronger. Whereas other people, I think, have sort of like their 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 bodies are tighter, and so they don't need to work as hard to create tension. For me, it's far more important to do that, and that seems to have an impact yeah. on how well I do uh, at at strength related feats. It's just because I I don't have it in abundance like other people do. I have I'm good at relaxation, and I'm good at you know at not being super tense and uh, and things of that nature. So um, the fact that you're doing higher rep stuff and, it, and it's on a daily basis, well, for me, you know, the, the thing that seems to work the best is having more of that tension in my regular practice in order to build up to those, to those levels of, of performance. But that's not the case for everybody. So this is another exactly. good example of, you know, like we talked about the scientific uh, or the, the science-based training, quote unquote. Um, and I think that's one place where it falls a little flat is that you can't really prove everything with science. I think you can observe a lot of things, um, but it's also always under certain conditions. And that there is, I had uh, Berge Fagerli on my, on my podcast a few months ago. He's a um, Norwegian strength, uh, particularly hypertrophy specialist. He's really, really smart. He was featured in Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, daily emails once. Um, because he's got a really interesting system for, for muscle building called myo reps. And 
you'll be able to, uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time talking about it, but he talked about it on, on the podcast and he's got some really great information on it. But he said the same thing. He said, he, in his opinion, actually, he said, uh, training is more of an art than it is a science. You know, there's a science element to it, but it's more of an art than a science because there's the individualization aspect that a lot of people forget about. And you can do, um, you know, prefabricated programs and make great results if it's pretty close to what you need to begin with. And if you're, you have the requirements in place, but there are certain things for which you're going to need uh, specific coaching. You're going to need individual coaching. And, you know, again, this is what you do for a living. And so I'm sure that a lot of the people who've come in and uh, maybe they've, they've learned online or they've learned with, you know, another, another coach, somebody maybe who doesn't have as much experience, they've probably gotten a pretty, pretty long way, but because you've got the depth of experience that you have, you have the ability to take a guy like the, the guy who came in swinging 16 kilos and in an, under an hour, he was swinging 32, you know, that comes with understanding what that individual needs. And it's not always easy to just throw a template at the person and say, you know, best of luck. It'll only get them so far. Yeah. And that's um, like, they, like they say, the coach's eye. Yeah. But that's the experience you have. And that is something that's hard to express in words. Yeah. Um, how will how, how should you teach somebody the coach's eye? I mean, it's just um, it's hours and hours of observing people move. Yeah. Um, trying different things, see how they work. Maybe you start to discern a certain pattern, like yeah. let's say for longer limb people, this might be the case. For shorter limb people, you have such and such um, deviations from that rule. But but it's it's. Uh, Sometimes it's just a feeling. It's like yeah, exactly. That's the word I was looking for. It's a feeling, and yeah. you cannot really explain why. And in regard to training and something like that, I mean, completely different realm now. But Bruce Lee basically used his martial art to express himself as a human being. Yeah, and I think this is also something that that plays into why different people choose different exercises. Yeah. Not everybody wants to be a powerlifter. Let's say so. Not everybody has to to just focus on the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift. Yeah. Um. Certain people might be drawn to to other exercises. Why? Why was I drawn to the Dinny Stones? Why was I drawn to Sinister? I have no idea. It just spoke to me, for for one reason or another. That is what I wanted to do. Um. In regards to the Dinny Stones, I think something else played into that. Just being part of that tradition of that heritage yeah just having my my name on that page um um but but again right now why, why the snatch and why the presses i don't know it just feels good yeah the results i feel and i see getting it's working uh but it's just i mean there are uh, countless exercise uh combinations let's say you could do yeah but, but for whatever reason people get drawn to a certain one the thing that people need to keep in mind is that all decisions are essentially emotional decisions and that we yeah. justify them with logic. And I know people are out there like, no, oh, I make logical decisions. You don't, all right? I, I know no. you think you're different and you're special, uh, but but that's the way that it is. You find something that you really like. And you know, some of the things that we like are things that it's just that we're good at. Other times we find things that we like and it's because we're not very good at them and we're trying to get better at them. And yeah. it's that process of getting better that really draws us into want to put more of an effort into it. And, you know, it, 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 but no matter what, it's how you react to a particular thing, a particular exercise, there might be an exercise that you like, but that it hurts you. So, you know, even if you're like predisposed to being pretty good at it, it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to do it. So the, the big takeaway needs to be two things. Number one, that uh, you're probably going to make the best progress by doing something that you can, you can do safely, but that you can also do successfully. And number two, something that you you talked about earlier that I want to go back to is the the stones on the beach in Iceland and how um, the if, if if you could only lift the lighter when you were considered useless, and you know we look at it as kind of harsh now, but I think that the takeaway is that being strong is useful and it makes yes. you more useful. And uh, you know I've I have yet to meet anybody who got stronger who was like, man, I really regret that. You know, it's like Never, versus. Ever. I know people who've been like, oh gosh, I used to run all the time. And it was just, I think of all the time I wasted, not because running is bad, running is awesome. But if you did it to the to the exclusion of other things that you need to do to to uh, develop your body, 
uh, it's you maybe not building as much uh, utility into your life. And so yeah. don't be useless, folks. You want to be useful. Get strong. And if one great way to get strong would be to follow Sven on social media <laughs> of all sorts. Do you have any particular places people can follow you and your training and that of your students? Uh, Instagram for now. Great. There will be something coming up probably by next year. Let's see how things develop. Good. Uh, but for now, you will find me on Instagram on Facebook as well. Although Facebook, uh, yeah, I don't post that regularly on Facebook anymore. So yeah, anything I, you post, they're like, you've offended the algorithm. <laughs> so now exactly. yeah, they you're... start to hide comments and stuff like that. It's, it's a weird place by now. It's yeah, it's very unfortunate because it used to be a, a lot of fun. And now it's like, you know, you say the wrong thing and yeah, you yeah. just nobody That's sees your it. content. It's no good. But uh, any website? You have a website coming out at some point? Th that is something that is still a big project of mine. Cool. Um, but those things will <laughs> sadly have to wait a little longer for now. Sure. Um, because not not many people know that. I think um, I started physiotherapy school two years ago. Oh, exciting. So I have one more year at school being a full-time student. Nice. And that takes up quite a lot of time, Yeah, which is a few things had to take a backseat right now. Of course. Um, but but the, there, there are a few things, projects that will, will hopefully start and get finalized in the next one or two years. Good. So, um, you, but if you follow me on Instagram, <laughs> you, you, will will, will, you will know. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you get your your degree and license as a physical therapist, then you have my uh, permission and blessing to use the term Germany's strongest physical therapist. So <laughs> oh. You don't have to call yourself that. I've called you that and you only have to repeat it. So now you are almost officially Germany's almost strongest official. physical therapist. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> I think it's going to give you a big advantage in the marketplace. That's for sure. It was an interesting thing. Um, that again, looking back, it was kind of a natural uh, development, let's say. Yeah. So um, I used to fairly intensely uh, study martial arts. Mm -hmm. So my best friend is a full instructor under Guru Dan Inosanto. So really? Coming back to Bruce Lee. Yeah. Wow. Guru Dan is Bruce Lee's oldest friend and best student. Yeah. And um, he took me to los angeles three times so in 2011 12 and 13 wow so being there training at the Inosanto academy taking classes directly from guru dan that was just a amazing experience um and i remember guru telling us a story one evening um about how a lot of the the masters and grandmasters of martial arts over time became healers yeah Kind of need to. They, yeah, they and they basically transformed their knowledge of how to harm the body yeah. into how to, to heal it. Because basically, if you just reverse the things you do to, let's just say, uh, break the joint, you know how it works, yeah. how it needs to work, and what to do if, if certain things are not going uh, the way they should be. And, and he said something, and I think he got that from from uh, somebody else, but it was basically like healing is the highest expression of the art. Certainly. And, and there was something like, yeah, you know, actually, it's the same with strength training at one point. You know how to make the body stronger. And, and that is, and for me, it was just the next logical uh, step to take. Um, we also have the quote from from Hackenschmidt, like strength and health, uh, strength cannot be divorced from health. Yeah. So so that was sawing those two two quotes next to next. It was like, yeah, actually, that is exactly what I need to do from here on now. And I'm not sure exactly how I will merge those two things, because I mean, yeah, it's three years of school, but that doesn't mean I have any experience. Um, that will come afterwards, yeah. implementing the things I learned. But it's definitely something I think I can help a lot of people with. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will be interesting w where I will be able to take that. I think when the time comes, you'll know, because a lot yeah. of people who get involved with strength training need physical therapy at some point or another, because it's, you know, we talked about earlier, passion is yeah. uh, suffering. And so people yeah. follow their passion of strength training to the point where sometimes they have to suffer. So it's... Uh, 
at some point they have to learn how to be how to follow it without injuring themselves at the same time so well i'm excited i'm looking forward to hearing how you do and of <laughs> course i'm sure i'll hit you up for all sorts of like hey this is bothering me what you know what should i what should i do uh but Follow Sven on Instagram, and then eventually he's going to have a website. He'll have all sorts of other great stuff you'll be able to be in contact with him for. And I want to say thank you for being on the show. I know we talked about this. We started uh, initially conversing about you know you coming on about a month ago, and so I'm really appreciative yeah. that you were able to take time out of your busy schedule to be able to uh, come on the show. Thank you very much for, for having me on, and uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. I've listened to so many of your interviews of the podcast you did with other great people and now being here actually uh as a part of that is pretty amazing so thank you very much my pleasure my pleasure and folks as always have fun and happy training